I read a ton of sweet romance. I have read every book Hallmark Publishing has put out. And then I've read ones that are sort of similar in that genre from other publishers as well. So I read really wide in that genre. I know how those books work. I know the kind of things that are always in the books. Like I know sort of the pacing of those books. And so that makes it easier to write it if it's something you're already reading a lot of. And so I still read read a lot like at night and on the weekends when I need a break from my, you know, writing my book or whatever. I'm reading other people's books because that reminds me of sort of the pacing and the reader expectations. So I think reading is really important. And then I wish that I had like paid more attention to the craft because I've written several beginnings to novels over the years that never went anywhere that my agent ripped apart. And she's right. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was just like flying by the seat of my pants and thought just because I read books, I could write a book. And that isn't necessarily true. Welcome to Become a Media Maven. I am your host, Christina Nicholson, and I am so excited for this episode. We are talking to my friend, Christy Dosh, aka Savannah Carlisle. We will explain what that means in this episode, but Christy is somebody who we talk multiple times a week. We do this through Voxer. We've actually, I don't think we've ever spoken on the phone and I don't think we've ever, no, I know we've never met in person, Um, but we Vox all the time because we have a lot of similarities and we just love each other. Something she is doing as of late that has me super impressed and I'm so interested in it is she is writing a fiction book. She has written a nonfiction book, traditionally published, and now she is writing a fiction book. It is a romance novel, and her big goal is to get it published through Hallmark and to turn it into a Hallmark movie. In this episode, she is going to tell us about the process. She is going to tell us why we are calling her Savannah Carlisle and not Christy Dosh, and everything in between. This is super interesting. If you're a reader like me, you're going to find this pretty cool. And if you've ever thought of writing a book before, you are also going to find this very interesting. So I know you will enjoy this episode with my friend, Savannah Carlisle. Ever wonder how some people seem to get a ton of media coverage and you don't? Welcome to Become a Media Maven, where TV reporter, host, and news contributor Christina Nicholson shares years of media experience to help you get the media attention you and your business deserve. And now, to help you master your media coverage, Christina Nicholson. Christy, you are back, baby. Yes, thanks for having me again. It's been a while. I know too long, right? Except that we talk almost every day. So it doesn't really feel like that. It's just long for the listeners. (laughs) It's long for the listeners for us. We are like Voxer BFFs. Um, My husband knows your voice now. He's like, oh, that's your friend (laughs) Dina. I'm like, yes, yes, it is. (laughs) That's so funny. I love it. Um, So last time you were on, we talked about, mostly it was about getting paid to speak, but there was a little overlap there with being a nonfiction author because the two kind of go hand in hand and help each other out. Recently, I have been in awe of you and what you're doing and how you're prioritizing your time because you are writing a fiction book. Like me, you're an avid reader. I prefer murder in my books. (laughs) You, You are writing with the goal of getting published by Hallmark and getting this book turned into a Hallmark movie, which means no murder. Um, But talk to us about what you're doing and why in the hell you decided to do this because it's a lot of work. (laughs) So it's been a little bit of a long-term strategy. When I got my agent for my nonfiction book, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, I purposely chose an agent that also represented fiction. Like I got really lucky when I went through the querying process and I got offers from three different agents but one of them represented primarily fiction um, and actually nonfiction was a little more outside of the box for her. So she signed me for my nonfiction book about the business of college sports because I was ESPN's sports business reporter back then. But I chose her because I knew one day I was going to write fiction. I had already been kind of dabbling in like writing chapters here and there. 
there. Um, and it has taken me 10 years now <laughs> to have the time to not only write the book, but to have taken like a whole bunch of classes and stuff on craft and like how to write fiction, because it's a really different process than writing nonfiction was. Okay. So you've always wanted to write a fiction book. What was it that you were like just recently? Okay. I have the agent already, so I might as well just write this. Like what, what was the thing? And it's been quite a while since you worked with this agent. So did you go back to her and say, Hey, can I write a fiction book? And will you like rep me? <laughs> yeah. So I woke up, it's probably been almost two years ago now. I woke up one morning and for a really long time, I had wanted to write a book that somehow piggybacked off of this Miranda Lambert song that I love called the house that built me. It came out like 10 years ago. And I always in the back of my mind have played around with ideas that kind of built on that song, but I never had enough of an idea to sit down and actually start writing anything. And then I woke up one morning and I don't know if I had like dreamed about it or what happened, but I remember waking up and like the idea was there. Like I knew how to piggyback off the song and have a whole book. And I like grabbed a notebook and scribbled down everything I could remember really quickly. And then I let myself just kind of like marinate in it for a few days to see like, was it going to stick? Like, did I really want to write this? Because at that point I was actually a few chapters into a women's fiction novel. And this idea falls more under the genre of what they call sweet or clean romance. So it's a little bit different than what I had been like trying and failing to write. Um, and so I kind of marinated on it and I emailed my agent and she knows that I've wanted to write fiction because I have sent her chapters previously, which she has, uh, totally chewed up and spit out and told me it needed more work. <laughs> and I emailed her and I said I was going to work on this new thing. And I basically asked, like, would she even represent me? And she said, I don't know. I'll have to see what you write. So I sat down to write something. I believe she told me to send it to her once I had 20,000 words. And that took me a, a few months at least. I'm trying to remember exactly how long it was, but it was for sure a few months to get that 20,000 down. And I sent it to her and um, she had a lot of feedback and a lot of suggestions, but it wasn't as much ripping up as the last thing I had sent her. And so that gave me a little confidence that really these like classes I had started taking and the things I was doing to try to like improve the craft and like learn how to develop characters and learn how to develop a story arc that like it was paying off and it was working. And so I went back and I edited those 20,000 words. I even hired a developmental editor to help me develop, uh, go through those 20,000 words and get them all shiny and perfect. And she agreed to show it to publishers. So that was about a year ago. And now I have completely finished that manuscript. You have read bits and pieces of it. And in fact, one of my characters has a little Christina Nicholson in her. I have channeled your spunky attitude for one of my characters and she has become my favorite. <laughs> so people get ready to see me on Hallmark because I told Christy <laughs> that she needs to tell the folks at Hallmark that Gigi is present and accounted for. We will not be hiring a professional <laughs> actress. We will be hiring Christina Nicholson to play that role. Yes, because you already are her. I borrowed some details from another friend who's an attorney because this character is an attorney. And so I borrowed some things from that friend. And, you know, you fictionalize everything. Like I borrowed bits and pieces of different people that I know. But when I'm sitting writing her, she's a secondary character in the first novel. But now I'm working on the second novel um, so that it would be a series. And the second novel focuses focuses on Gigi's story. And every time I sit down to write her, I picture you in my head and I picture some of the th things that you say to me on Voxer because I think <laughs> you're so like sassy and spunky and you just tell it like it is. And that is who Gigi is. And so I channel you every time I sit down to write Gigi. <laughs> okay. This is like a lot of work for not knowing what's going to happen. I mean, I feel, and you know what I feel was saying that I feel dumb because it's like, that's like having a business coach and starting a business. It's a lot of work, not knowing what's going to happen, but that's what you're doing. Like you're spending a ridiculous amount of time writing this book, going through edits in the hopes of getting a book deal. Like, are you ever like, <laughs> I mean, like, I what just, am I know, doing with my life? <laughs> no, not what are you doing with your life? But I mean, do you ever think <clears throat> like, what if this, doesn't happen. What if I don't get a book deal? Then what do I do with this book? You know what I mean? 
Yes. Because it's a so, lot of time. It's a lot of time I, you're spending it, on this. It is. I mean, I spent a year and a half writing the first book, which um, for that genre, different genres have different like word count expectations. And for uh, this genre of romance, you want to be somewhere between 75,000 and 90,000 words. And I ended up coming in uh, right around 90,000. So it took me a year and a half to write the 90,000. Now, there were times I took a break, like when I was waiting to get feedback from my agent a couple of times, I would just put it aside and not work on it at all. Or when I got busy in my business, because I'm a publicist like you are, and you know, we have busier times of the year, obviously my clients come first. And so I would put this aside. So there were breaks, but it took me a year and a half to get a draft that uh, now my agent has out on submission to a handful of publishers that we think would be a really good fit, Hallmark being one of them. Um, but there's several others that I'm really interested in as well as I've learned more about the industry and just read more books and seen other places my book could fit in. And the advice I got was, you know, don't stop. You have to keep writing. Like publishers want to invest not for a one-off novel. They want to invest in your career as an author. And so they want to know you have more books in you. And because I had already decided I wanted to go into a second book that would be a series where I would stay in the same town and focus on some of the secondary characters from the first book, it was really easy to just start writing the second one because my head was like already in that place with that in that town and with those characters. But it's excruciating because it's really different than nonfiction. With nonfiction, you sell the book based on a proposal, but you don't actually write the whole book yet. So by the time I got my deal for my nonfiction book, you know, I had the proposal and I had written, I think, two chapters. But then I had a conversation with the publisher and they told me kind of some uh, advice on the direction they wanted me to go with the book. And then I had a year to write the book and meet my contract deadline. Fiction's totally different. Fiction uh, publishers generally only buy once you've written the entire book and been through some edits with your agent or if you hire outside editors. So you're right, I wrote an entire book. I have no idea if anyone will buy it. And now I'm already like knee deep in a second book in the series. And I still have no idea whether it'll ever see the light of day or not. So I'm starting to teach myself some things about self-publishing in case I decide to go that route down the road. But for now, fingers crossed, um, several publishers I think are a really good fit, have it in their hands. So, you know, send all the good vibes, prayers, finger crossing <laughs> that I get a deal. <laughs> it's so much work. How do you prioritize the time? Because obviously right now you're not making money doing it. You have other things that you do that do bring in money. So how do you prioritize your time on doing something that, that you want to do that isn't profitable versus what you have to do because it is profitable. I feel like this is something we all struggle with. Yeah, I never could have done this, I don't think, in the first couple of years of my business. I just had my five-year business anniversary, and really, I'm not sure that I was in a place to do this any earlier than I did it, which was about a year and a half ago, because... I didn't have a team in place, you know, the first year or two. And then even once I started hiring, I made some bad hires. So I have a stellar team now, and I've had kind of the current makeup of my team for a little over a year now. And that is part of what allows me to have time is that having this great team has allowed me to step back a little and not be as like mired down in the day to day because I know they're taking care of things. I'm still doing business development and I'm still there for them to bounce ideas off of, but I'm not like doing the nitty gritty pitching every day anymore. So that frees up time. And I just try to dedicate one hour a day to it. So my goal is to write a thousand words a day. Um, so you could write a novel. If you really did a thousand words a day, you could write one in three months. Um, but you're going to have days you take off and days you write less or more. And so I don't really expect to be done with a book every three months, but that gives me kind of a good baseline. And I can write a thousand words in an hour if I know where the story's going. Now there's some days I sit down and I'm stuck. Like I've backed my characters into a corner and I'm not sure how to get them out of it. And maybe I don't write as much that day, or maybe I don't write anything that day, but you know, most days I manage to get out a thousand words in an hour and it's the first thing I do. So early in the morning, first thing I get to my desk, that very first hour I'm at my desk, I'm writing and then that's it. I'm done for the day. Once that hour's up, then the rest of my day is spent in my business and all the other stuff I need to do. 
Okay, so what does that look like? Because I have been putting off for the longest time writing a book proposal. <laughs> yeah, and I've been trying to get you to write it for probably a year now. <laughs> listen, I'm going to start on Friday, I swear. Okay, um, okay. But, but this is the problem that I like, especially when it comes to fiction. Like, there's so many moving pieces, there's so many characters, and you're making stuff up. Like, how do you keep it all organized? Do you have, like... <laughs> a big bulletin board where you're like, this, this is this character, this is information about that. Like, how do you even keep it all together? Like, I'm just, I feel like it would be such a cluster for me. So when I first get the idea, like both for the other book and for this book, as I got the idea, I use Evernote just for everything. Like I use it in my business and my personal life and whatever I've used Evernote for, I don't know, a decade or more. And so I created a notebook in Evernote um, for my books. And then I've got like a note inside that notebook for each book. And I kind of sketched out the big picture idea for the book. And then as I think of things, which unfortunately almost always happens in the shower while driving or while walking the dog three times when I'm like nowhere near like a notebook or anything I could sit down and like write down on. And so I just leave myself little notes in Evernote. Like I basically just end up with this long bulleted list of like, you know, Hey, remember to have this character do this or what if this character had this quirk or you know what if this happened halfway through the book like just anything that comes to my mind I dump in this bulleted list in Evernote and then when I'm writing every day I'm doing this a little bit different than I did my nonfiction with my nonfiction I just opened Microsoft Word and started typing um, with this, I'm using a program called Scrivener, and it was created uh, exclusively for writing books. And I think I could have used it for my nonfiction book if it had existed. I'm not sure if it existed back then or not, but I certainly didn't know about it. Um, I could have used it for that, but I am using it for my fiction. And I really like it because it allows you to write essentially one scene at a time and it makes the scenes into these little like index cards and that makes it really easy to move things around when you realize something isn't working versus trying to like cut and paste and find the right spot in word it has a uh like a menu going down the left hand side of your screen where you can see all your scenes you can color code them like i color code by the point of view because i write every other chapter in the woman's point of view and then every other chapter in the man's point of view. And so I color code them pink and blue so that I know like whose scenes are whose. Um, and that allows me to just dump. And so when I think of something that needs to come in a future chapter, I just go ahead and write it down and then I can like move it around to where it goes when I get down to that part of the book. So there's a little bit of learning curve with that software, quite honestly. And I, I like to think that I'm pretty good with like software and apps, but I have to say there was a little bit of a learning curve to that one. But the good thing is there's awesome resources for it online. So many authors use it and people have dedicated entire blogs to giving like best use tips for Scrivener and teaching you how to use it. So anytime I've like gotten stuck or haven't been able to figure out how to do something, I've been able to find uh, a blog or an article that uh, tells me how to do it in Scrivener. So that's how I'm staying organized now. And it, it allows you to, you have these um, sections where you can put in like uh your locations and what they look like. You can put in character sketches. Um, some people plan all that stuff out in advance. They call them plotters and they know everything that's going to happen in the book and all the people who are going to be in the book and all the places that are going to be in the book ahead of time. And then they sit down and write. And then you have what they call pantsers, which are people who just sit down and start typing. They have no idea where they're going with the story. They just sit down and start writing. I tried the pantser method, the first couple of novels I tried to write, and it didn't work. You can get three or four chapters in with like great ideas, and then you're out, and you can't think of anything else, and you're not really developing the, the characters. You're not really developing the story arc. So I, um, am, I kind of am a hybrid now. I know what the whole big picture is going to be. I know how the book is going to end. I know how they're going to get there. I know what their like predominant character traits are, but I don't necessarily know every scene. And so I just sit down every morning and start writing. And every scene, I just ask myself, does this scene move the story forward? Does it serve a purpose? And and as long as I can say, yes, here's why we have to have this scene, then great. Then that scene gets to stay. So, you know, the ending, it's just a matter of filling in how much. we get there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So you Which kind I don't of do always a, know. <laughs> you kind of do a little bit of both. It sounds like. 
Right. So I kind of know the big strokes of what's going to happen. Like I know the big character flaw that each of my characters has. I know what they think their sort of end goal is. Like if you read books on craft, they always talk about external plot versus like internal character arc. So external plot is like what is happening around them, that goal they're trying to reach. Like maybe, you know, in my first book, you and I have talked about it a lot, but my heroine is a singer. She started out as a country music singer. Her label moved her into pop music. Now she wants to go back to country, but her label doesn't want her to. And so the external plot is her trying to figure out her career path and where she's going to go from here. But that's, you also have to develop the story on the, with the internal character. Like, how has she gotten into this situation? Why is it difficult for her? Like, what is it about her personality and about her past that makes this hard? Like, what does she have to overcome to get what she wants? You know, and in all of that, she is running back into her high school boyfriend who she hasn't seen in almost 10 years. Um, and, you know, there's this whole other storyline going on where what they both want is at odds with one another, but they were very much in love when they were teenagers and they're very much falling for each other again. And so how can they both get what they want and end up together when what they want is so, uh, you know, antithetical to the other person. And so you got to know all that stuff. Like I knew all that going into it, but then I would sit down to write a scene and I would be like, I don't know, what are they doing today? Like, <laughs> you know, I knew the big points I needed to hit, but those little scenes in between where you get to know the character and where they're developing affection for each other, those are the ones that when I sit down every morning, I don't always know what I'm going to write that day and how I'm going to get them where they're going. Um, and it's a lot harder some days than others. It just depends. And you like went above and beyond and you had somebody write a song for the book and you can't even hear the song in the book but like you sent it to me and it's freaking amazing <laughs> yeah which is all the songwriter I came up with the title for the song um and it, I think it may end up being the title for the book it's called saltwater revival and so I knew I wanted that to be the title based on what had been happening in the book and then I sent the synopsis of the book which is like a three-page document that tells the whole story including the ending I mean it gives everything away I sent that to the songwriter that I worked with and I sort of told her who my character's were, what they wanted, what they were struggling with, but in particular, the female character who's the singer, because she's the one writing this song. And this is when you get into like, uh, you know, sort of the, the nitty gritty of like the work sort of side of this is that um, you can't use just any song out in the world in your book. Like I said, originally, this book was based on this song from Miranda Lambert that I love called The House That Built Me. And in fact, the working title for the book from the very beginning was The House That Built me. Well, it turns out you can use the title of a song. So me titling the book the same thing as the song, no problem legally. However, I cannot use any of the lyrics from the house that built me without getting permission from the owner of that. And it's not even the songwriter anymore. It's like BMI or one of the big music groups owns it. You have to go through all this paperwork and often you have to pay to use the lyrics in your book. And so I thought, forget this. I'm going to go find a songwriter. We'll write our own song that's more specific to this book. And then I can have my heroine write bits and pieces of it throughout the book. And so there's snippets of the lyrics throughout the book, but never the full song. Um, and if it gets published, like I'd love to have the lyrics for the full song printed maybe at the end of the book or something. But, you know, me and you, we we work in PR and marketing every day. I think our brains work different than the typical author. And so as I'm looking ahead to how I'm going to market this book when it comes out, I thought, how cool would it be? to not only release the book, but on the same day, release an original song that goes with the book. Like, I just feel like that would be really interesting. I looked it up and it's not, it's not completely original. I did find one or two other authors who have done that before, um, but I had never heard of it before. And so I don't think it's something that gets done all that often. And, and maybe it's too gimmicky and people don't like it. I don't know, but I thought it was really cool. And when she sent the song back, 
I like got goosebumps. I could not believe how well she understood my character and what she was going through. We only ended up changing two lines of the song during the editing process. And that was it. Otherwise, it's almost exactly what she sent me the first time she sent me lyrics. And then she recorded it. And I think it sounds like something that could be on the radio tomorrow. Like, I want to, now I'm like trying to figure out how do you get songs on the radio? Like, how do you get this song in the hands of somebody like Miranda Lambert to try to get them to record the song because I own the rights to it now and I could get someone to perhaps record it. So now I'm trying to teach myself about the music industry as if I have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you. This song is, it's freaking amazing. If it were on iTunes, I would buy it. Um, how did you, like, you're so, that's so creative. Like, it's very creative. Have you always been just crazy creative like that? It's interesting because until recently, I probably wouldn't have ever described myself as creative because I'm an attorney and I think that I'm super analytical a lot of the time. I'm not good at any, like when I think creative, I think people who are like artistic and craftsy, like I see stuff on Pinterest and I try to do it. And like, I am like the queen of the Pinterest fail. Like I cannot make anything. I can't cook. I can't do DIY projects. Like I can't do anything crafty or scrapbooky. Like none of that is my thing. I'm not good at it at all. But I do think I'm a good writer. You know, I, I have written, I've been a journalist. I've written a nonfiction book. Now I'm writing fiction. Even when I was an attorney, I drafted contracts all day. Like, I think I'm a good writer. And that obviously takes some creativity. And now I've gotten super into, and I've been telling you about it, Bookstagram on Instagram is this like whole oh. community of people who do nothing but talk about Christy. the books they're reading. It's addicting. <laughs> And oh it makes my God, me I love build, it. Like more bookshelves <laughs> in my house. And I just, it's, it's unbelievable. I love Bookstagram. Well, and people post these like flat lay photos, which I sort of knew what flat lays were. I spoke at a conference a few years ago for bloggers and there was a whole session on flat lays. So I had sort of learned about it, but they were fashion bloggers. And it turns out that a lot of people do flat lays with bookstagram. And so they take the book or they take like their iPad showing the book cover and they, you know, use flowers and seashells and whatever they lay all this stuff out around it and then you take you know a photo essentially standing over top of it and they create these beautiful photos they put on instagram about the books that they're reading and so i started trying to do it about a month you do ago it, you do it very well Oh my God. I love it pretty. now. I'm so addicted to it. I now, I spent this weekend cleaning out a filing cabinet that had a lot of my old sports research in it. And I cleaned it out to make room because I have been buying up all these little things on Etsy to like be in my pictures. Like I read a lot of beach reads. And so I was buying up like little pieces of coral and like a piece of like nautical rope. And I got like a fishing net and like just ridiculous stuff that I can use in my photos. And my husband was like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I've gotten really into it and it does make me feel creative. So maybe, maybe I'm more creative than I've given myself credit for. A hundred percent. Your pictures are beautiful. Yes. Oh, thank you. They're very pretty. Okay. I have always told you that when I talk to my friend Lisa about you, I always say Christy Dosh because I just think your name is so fun to say. <laughs> um, but... You have built this brand as Christy Dosh, the media expert, the sports media expert, and you were advised to not be Christy Dosh when you went fiction. Can you explain why and what you're doing now? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons that people choose pen names, ones that didn't necessarily apply to me. Like if you have been writing books, you know, in romance and you decide to write thrillers, sometimes they'll tell you to use a pen name so that you don't um, like disappoint your readers who were expecting something different. And because men tend to sell better in certain categories. So a lot of women will write under like an initial, um, you know, like Nora Roberts writes as JD Rob when she does thrillers. Um, so a lot of folks when they cross over will do a name that fits into the genre better. 
Um, and I started talking to my agent about whether I should have a pen name because I do have a published book about sports under Christy Dosh. And actually I have another one I'm under contract for that hasn't been published yet, but those would both be sports business books. And ChristyDosh.com as a website has existed for about 12 years now. And everything it ranks for is related to sports. Um, my social media channels under that name are all related to my sports work. And I still do that work. I still write for Forbes. I do TV work for ESPN. Like that's still a part of my life. And so I talked to my agent and I talked to an editor that I know about it. And um, they felt like it made sense to have a pin name because if for no other reason than Amazon tries to guess what people want to read next. And so they show you things if you're reading in the Kindle app or they'll recommend things on the website, they'll send you emails. And if you're writing two totally different kinds of books under the same name, it's going to end up offering up a book that maybe readers aren't interested in. So like my sports fan followers may not want to hear about my romance books because quite frankly, most of my sports followers are men. They're probably not going to read my romance. And so I really needed to separate it and build a whole new audience who is interested in what I'm doing with this. And as I decided to come up with a pen name. Um, I also shared with you that I decided to combine my author brand with a sort of lifestyle blog because my whole life centers around the beach. I love beach reads. What I'm writing, I would consider a beach read. I live at the beach. I travel a lot to other beaches. My house is decorated like in a very beach inspired sort of style. And so I realized that I could maybe build this sort of community and audience around my love of the beach and my sort of beach lifestyle and grow an audience before these books ever come out so that when they come out in a year or two, because the traditional publishing process is super slow, um, you know, God willing that a publisher picks it up and it comes out in a year or two, I would already have built up an audience through this lifestyle blog that will hopefully be interested in these books as well. So I've been reviewing other people's books since I don't have my own to share yet. And then I've started writing about other stuff like home decor and fashion and art and all the other stuff in my life that's related to the beach. And it's been really fun. Like I've gotten, I've been able to create a whole new brand um, and essentially a whole new business. And I forgot how much fun that was because it's been five years since I started my business and I'm so bogged down in kind of the problems you have once you've grown your business that I forgot how exciting it was to do all that beginning branding kind of stuff. So it's been fun. So question on the timing of that. It's one thing to spend an hour a day writing your book, but this whole building a brand with a lifestyle website and putting up blog posts and building the Instagram and the Twitter and all of that. How much time are you putting towards that? And how do you feel about prioritizing that again to build something while you also have to make money with the other stuff that's already going on? Yeah. So that, that part is more difficult because I feel like it takes like one to two hours a day on Instagram to get any sort of real engagement and traction and grow your account and be getting the comments and the like, especially, I mean, I had to start from zero. I started all new social media accounts. I chose the name Savannah Carlisle after a lot of sort of research and I got the URL. I made sure I could get all of the social media handles, but I had to start from zero. I mean, I have followers on platforms for sports and then I have the accounts for the PR agency, but I had to start from absolutely zero. And it's been uh, almost two months now that I've been building it up. So I spend an hour or two a day on Instagram and then I'm trying to put up two or three blog posts a week. Um, a lot of those are book reviews and honestly, they're really fast and easy to write. I can pump out a book review and get it up in like 30, 45 minutes because it's not very long. So those don't take me a ton of time, but like I did a big uh, art roundup of artists who paint beachy and coastal kind of scenes. That one took me several hours. I've got a, uh, a fashion one that's like beach vacation dresses going up. That one took me a lot of time. So some of these bigger roundup posts took more time, but it's, be I, it's because I'm really following um, some good SEO 
practices and trying to, from the very beginning, really focus on SEO on this website so that when I am ready to market my books or otherwise kind of monetize this new brand, I've set the right, right foundation for it. And so I am working on it in some way every day. You know, some days it's an hour, some days it's three or four hours. It really depends on my schedule. And like I said, I would have never been able to do this in the early days of the PR business. I can only do it now because I have such a great team that's handling kind of the day to day and it really fluctuates. Like I haven't had any time today. I was recording trainings for my PR program and I had this scheduled with you. Like I, I you know, I haven't done anything on the blog or really Instagram mostly today. So it, it ebbs and flows. Um, and I just, I work on it when I can. And I tell you all the time because you've got three kids and I have none. When people ask how I get so much done, I say, cause I don't have kids. <laughs> I mean, it's a big part of it. That's true. And you have, you have a great team. I understand, you know, how having a team can help too. And you enjoy doing all of this, like the writing and the building the brand at savannacarlisle.com. Like you enjoy that part of it. Oh my gosh. I love it. So that's probably the thing is like, I'm not, I don't need free time for anything else right now. Like I'm not watching a lot of TV. Quite frankly, there's nothing on right now. Um, when big brother and the bachelorette come on in about a month, <laughs> I'm going to be screwed because uh, that is going to eat up a lot of the time that I'm currently using to build this brand. And I'm not willing to give up Big Brother or The Bachelorette, not even for this new brand. <laughs> so um, I am using, you know, any of my free time. Like I'm working on it early in the morning, late at night, over the weekends. But I've always been that way. I've always had some other thing I'm doing on the side. Like when I was an attorney, I was writing about sports on the side. I was getting up early in the morning to blog, staying up late at night, blogging over the weekends, you know, and that eventually grew into something where ESPN hired me away from my law firm. And I've always sort of had something on the side. And so it's the, this is my hobby. I don't have kids, you know, I don't like crochet or knit or I don't know, like uh, there's nothing I do sort of outside of work. And so this doesn't feel like work to me. This is fun. I love writing. I love the sort of branding and marketing aspect of it. And so as long as I enjoy doing it, I'm going to keep doing it. And if it starts to feel like a job, um, then it's probably something I will, uh, look at and potentially change what I'm doing because right now it's for fun. It's not a job. I don't need it to make money. My PR agency makes money. Um, this is a hobby right now. Okay. Two questions. One, not to be a negative Nancy, but <laughs> pretend you don't get a book deal. What do you do with this amazing book you've written? So I think that it would depend on what the feedback is from the publishers. I've already had a couple of publishers pass on it. Like, I don't want to sound like it's easy and everything is like sunshine and rainbows. It's not like I had one pass on it and say that the town was great, but that my characters didn't have enough attraction to one another. Well, um, clearly they don't know what they're talking about because <laughs> A, one of the characters is Gigi modeled after yours truly. And B, it's amazing. It's so subjective. And so I was talking to an author friend of mine who is like a USA Today bestseller. She's published with multiple different publishers. She's had two Hallmark movies. Like she's great at what she does. And she was telling me about all the passes she got on her first book. And I loved her first book. And she was like, yeah, you remember these two characters in the book? Somebody wanted the heroine to end up with this other character in the book. And I said, no. And so they passed on me. And so it's really subjective. Like it's usually one editor at a publishing house making that decision. And so if they didn't connect with the story or with the characters, they say, no, that doesn't mean no one's going to, or that it wouldn't be a successful book. It just means that one editor didn't connect with it. And so um, I had another one where it sounds like the editor really liked it. She took it to acquisitions committee, but it didn't get enough votes for them to acquire it. Um, so you get passes along the way. And my my dear friend, um, who's an author that I've been talking to about it, she said, you know, you only need one yes. And, you know, you and I for a living, you know, pitch clients and we've pitched ourselves before for all these PR opportunities. And we get no's all the time and don't take it that personally because we know there's other places to go. We know we'll find the right fit for the story. And this is the same way. Like, I know it's going to end up in the right hands, um, hopefully, and connect with somebody. And if it doesn't, but the feedback has been such, it's not like people are saying, you know, this doesn't work. This falls apart. It's too slow. It's not believable. Like, I'm not getting those kind of comments. If I was, I would probably 
rethink working with another editor or maybe just letting it go. However, that hasn't been the case. And I've sent out the full book to about a dozen people that I know. Some people I really know, like good friends of mine. And then some people are ladies I've met through Bookstagram who um, are more objective because they don't know me and they don't have to tell me nice things. And I've had them (laughs) read it and I've gotten really good feedback. So if a publisher doesn't pick it up, then I think I will seriously consider um, going the self-publishing route or with like a smaller indie publisher and trying to get it out there. Because to be honest, after working on it for a year and a half and now being like 16,000 words into the next book, I don't think I could live with not publishing it and it just Mm -hmm. living on my computer somewhere. Like I know it's good enough to publish. And I know I'm good enough at PR and marketing that even if I don't have a big publisher, I can get the word out about my own book. And a lot of authors don't feel comfortable with the marketing piece of it. And that's why they need a traditional publisher. But I know how to do that piece. You know, I'm a book publicist. I do it every day for nonfiction books. And although doing it for fiction is a little bit different, um, I still like, I think have the right instincts for that. And I'm convinced that I could do it on my own and be successful. So if that's what it comes down to, I'm fine with that. I love that. And something that reminded me um, when you were telling that story, I remember, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but James Patterson is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And somebody tweeted that like, maybe it was last year where he made like $96 million or whatever. Somebody tweeted that and he replied and he said how many times his first book was rejected. Mm-hmm. And it was like a whole lot of times. I mean, you hear that story with um, with J.K. Rowling, with yep. Harry Potter. Like it was rejected a ridiculous amount of times. So I love your attitude. Um, <laughs> last question. This sounds like a lot of work. I have, I would love to, just because I like to, to read and I love like a Lifetime movie, I would love to write, <laughs> I need the murder, Christy. I would love to write a book like that nowhere in the near future. I'm sure there's listeners who are like, Ooh, this sounds fun. Where does one even begin? You are a little different because you had an agent in place. However, for a fiction book, you need the book copy to get the agent, correct? So you've got to write first. Is that step number one? Yeah. And I would say it's good if it's somebody like you who reads in the genre you want to write in. Like I read a ton of sweet romance. I've read every book Hallmark Publishing has put out. And then I've read ones that are sort of similar in that genre from other publishers as well. So I read really wide in that genre. I know how those books work. I know the kind of things that are always in the books. Like I know sort of the pacing of those books. And so that makes it easier to write it if it's something you're already reading a lot of. And so I still read a lot like at night and on the weekends when I need a break from my, you know, writing my book or whatever. I'm reading other people's books because that reminds me of sort of the pacing and the reader expectations. So I think reading is really important. And then I wish that I had like paid more attention to the craft because I've written several beginnings to novels over the years that never went anywhere that my agent ripped apart. And she's right. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was just like flying by the seat of my pants and thought just because I read books, I could write a book. And that isn't necessarily true. So So, then what's the difference? Like, how do you know what you're doing now and you didn't before? What's the difference? So I think it's definitely the little like mini courses I took and the books I've read. So um, one of the books that's really great is called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. There was this famous book years ago called Save the Cat that was about screenwriting. And a novelist took it and made it Save the Cat Writes a Novel. Her name is Jessica Brody. And she talks about sort of the elements that have to be in there for it to be a good story and to keep people engaged and how to develop characters. So then because the book was so good, I looked and she offered these little mini courses. I think they're all on Udemy. And I bought up a bunch of those. They were super cheap. And I bought a bunch of those up and I would just listen to it while I was walking the dog. Although she has video, it's not really something you have to visually see. So I would listen to it while I was walking the dog. And then somebody told me to get masterclass. Um, like I, I love masterclass. Yeah, I think James Patterson has one in there. He and- does. 
Judy Bloom has one, David Baldacci. And even though they're not in my genre, they don't write romance, there's really good nuggets in all of their classes about world building and character building and story and setting. And so I think I took something from each one of those. And then I think what probably helped me the most, and this is genre specific, but if somebody wanted to write romance, there's a book called Romancing the Beat. And it taught it kind of takes the method from Save the Cat, which I had read first, which breaks books into what it calls beats. And so it talks about like the meet cute, you know, where the characters meet in the beginning and then arguments they each have against falling in love. And it's all these elements that have to be in the book in sort of an order they have to happen in. And she applies that basic story structure from Save the Cat to romance specifically and shows you how to break up your book into these like like chunks and these parts you kind of have to hit. And that has been huge for me. I have referred back to that book so many times. It is falling apart. I not only have the physical copy of it, I also have the audio book and I'll listen to it when I'm out walking the dog. Um, and so those kind of craft books and courses, I think made all the difference. And that's why I finished this book. I've never finished a novel. I have started probably five over the last 10 years. And I have never even gotten to the midpoint, much less finished. And this time I finished. And I think it's because I took the time to read those books and take those courses and really figure out how to tell a story and how to develop characters. I'm going to link to all of those resources in the show notes. I'm also linking to savannacarlisle.com, which is your pen name, your alias, your other personality. If people I love, love Hallmark movies, they'll love what I've got on there. All the books that I, I talk about on there and my own writing, it's all, all very Hallmark-esque, all very happily ever after, happy ending. Everybody's in love. Nothing bad happens. <laughs> and with everything that's going on in the world right now, I know I need more of that. <laughs> you don't, yeah, you don't do the murder like I do, I guess, huh? I do not. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I do read probably three thrillers a year. Um, I sneak them in, but I, what I find is if I read them while I'm writing on this book, like things seep in, like suddenly your character will say something and you're like, wait a second, that doesn't fit this book. <laughs> wait a minute. You're not crazy. It just gets into your consciousness and you write things, even not just like things your characters would do, but like the way they talk, like the way you just, the adjectives you use to describe them are different in a romance than in a thriller usually. And so I have to be careful when I read outside of my genre because it seeps into my writing. <laughs> you know what I read recently? And I guess it would be romance. And I kind of liked it. And I haven't read these books in years. It was a young adult novel. And it was called Tweet Cute. Um, oh, I heard about it. Yes. I haven't read it. So I don't know what took me so long to get on Goodreads, but it took me a real long time. And I'm glad I got on there because then I can see what other people are reading and you know how popular these books are and whatnot. And I read Tweet Cute and I was like, I'm reading a book for teenagers, but whatevs. Let's see how it is. And I like read the whole thing in a weekend because it was just so good and so cute. So now I was like, I need to go to this kid section in the bookstore in the <laughs> library now because these are fun books. So I don't always need murder. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> or like the psychological thrillers, right? Like the page turners. That's what James Patterson is really good. I think James Patterson has done something to me because he's got a few romance novels. He's got maybe like five. But the yeah. rest of them are all like edge of your seat suspense type of things. Yeah, okay. What's interesting is I like when it comes to podcasts, I almost exclusively listen to two kinds of podcasts, reality TV, because as I already said, I love Big Brother and the Bachelor franchise. So I listen to a lot of reality TV podcasts and I listen to a ton of true crime podcasts. I love yes. true crime podcasts, but like, I don't want to write about that kind of stuff. <laughs> true crime is good. Did you listen to Dirty John? I did. And I watched the uh, series on TV. Yes. You know, I had Tara Newell on the podcast. I do. I think I listened to that episode because oh I was my. really into, um, so, I think I actually watched the mini series on TV first. Then I went back and listened to the podcast. Yes. It is a fascinating story. And I told her on the podcast, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm saying this is like you almost being murdered and having to kill a man in self-defense is fascinating, but just the whole thing is it's like insane. The story yeah. is wild. 
But see, I'm not creative in that way. Like, I don't think my, and I know that one's a true story, but like when it comes to writing fiction like that, I don't think I could put something like that together. But these like sweet romances um, where everybody ends up happily ever after, I find that, that, I find that easy and enjoyable. Like it puts me in a great mood. Oh, maybe there's something wrong with me. No, <laughs> no I don't think that that's the case. <laughs> okay, this was awesome. I'm, I'm linking to everything in the show notes. This is, I'm just, we're turning this into the longest podcast interview ever just because we like to talk to each other. I know, um, if you've only knew how many messages we send each other all day long. <laughs> okay, this is amazing. Um, people, go find Savannah Carlisle. She's the one we're talking to, even though I call her Christy Dosh. Um, <laughs> SavannahCarlisle.com. What's the, what's the Instagram? It's Savvy Carlisle. So two Vs because Savannah Carlisle is too long for some of the social media networks. So all my social media is mm-hmm. Savvy Carlisle. Oh, okay. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, my love. This was amazing. I'm going to start writing my book proposal and then see, cause I don't even want to write the book. Like if I don't get a book deal, I'm not writing it. But then like, yeah. which you can do for nonfiction, you can shop around the proposal and if, yeah. and if nothing happens, then nothing happens. But I'm going to start yeah. checking in with you on Fridays. Cause you said you're going to do it Fridays. So uh-huh. Friday afternoon, Friday evening, I'm going to start checking in on you. Everybody needs a friend like Christy. See people. <laughs> this is why we box all day, every day. It's mutually beneficial. It is for sure. Okay. Thanks my love. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Remember, I'm always putting all of the goodness in the show notes. You can get those at becomeamediamaven.com. So you will see all of those things that we talked about. I am linking to them for easy access for you. Thank you again for listening. You know I appreciate those ratings and those reviews. So if you haven't yet, please tap away on your screen and share your thoughts with me. I appreciate it. And I will see you again very soon right here on Become a Media Maven.